Ian, when did Noah build the ark? If I know. Before the rain. Before oh, that's the a rain. good point. That's a good point. Noah, this is a, this is this, he's in the Holy Bible. Is this the, is this the St. James version? The Have you ever heard of, of Noah's Ark, Ian? Have version? you ever heard of Noah's Ark? I think I have. Wasn't that Russell Crowe? Didn't he play him in a movie on the same topic? Steve Carell. Okay. But um, the, the point of the matter is, if you use the reference and it goes back thousands of years, Noah built the ark before the rain. What we're saying is it's going to rain, whatever your ark looks like, build it now. And if you're not filled with the Holy Spirit like Frank Cava, you should have more cash. You're listening to Let Me Speak to a Manager with Frank Cava and Ian Matthews. What a crack of shit. Yeah, that was a hot mic, Sam. You can't say God on the air. Don't worry, nobody's listening anyway. Do it live! I can, I'll write it and we'll do it live! Frankie! Ian, you son of a bitch. How you doing today, buddy? I'm good. I'm at a home game today. I haven't recorded a podcast from home in some time. I know. You've upgraded your equipment, too. It's very exciting. It is nice. I'm sure something else will break. Frank has expanded his camera multiple times because he wants to show off all of his knickknacks in his home office. Correct. Like, look at Superman's legs. I've had that thing since uh, my granddad bought that for me when I was like four. It's a telephone. No one gives a shit about all the books on your shelves that were given to you as gifts that you never read. Correct. No one cares. No one cares that you tried to seem smart with an Albert Einstein book back there that you've never read. It's not Albert Einstein. That's a postcard. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's homage to, uh, that's right here. It's homage to um, Shawshank Redemption. I've had one of these in my office for two decades. Hmm. So we are... Uh, talking about real estate today and we are talking about residential real estate which is uh the uh center of frankie's life and um also a big part of what drives our economy everything else frankie was just at imn which is a big real estate conference uh just a couple of weeks ago and we're going to talk about in this episode we're going to talk about some of the things that frank took away kind of his gut feels which i think are more we went through an agenda and we're not going to rehash all of the speakers. I think Frank's gut reaction to these things is usually pretty, pretty accurate. Um, but I, interesting in, in enough, uh, I was telling Frank, I, I talked to um, one of our customers for our car alarms this morning and she's from Sarasota. She's 60 years old, Frankie, and uh, works two jobs. She has two bartender jobs, one, a regular gig at night, and another one, she works on the weekends at like a, a, like a kind of like a day club, but not too crazy of one. But she, she has two jobs to pay the bills. Um, she bought one of our devices. She was a hoot to talk to. But we were talking about just out of nowhere, she volunteers. Um, I think I was asking her about affordability of our product, what she thought the price was. And she was talking about she wanted it because she just bought a new Jeep. And she's like, it's a really big investment for me. Um, and I don't want anyone messing with my Jeep. And I worry about it because I park in places where there's lots of drunk people. And, um, you know, I don't want need people breaking in, it would be expensive for me. And she's like, it's already expensive enough, just living today. Like, I don't need people stealing my stuff. And I said, Well, tell me more, like what's going on in Sarasota? And she's like, Well, I've lived in the same house for 20 years. She's 60 years old. She's like, so, I, you know, I'm not out shopping for a new house. I love my house. She's like, but I just feel so bad for all these kids that I work with as bartenders in these restaurants. She said they're paying $2,400, $2,500 a month in rent. And these are for crappy apartments and people's basements. And this is Sarasota. She's like, this isn't even an exciting market. She's like, and I ask them, how do you even afford that? She's like, I know what they make on a bartender on bartender income, I don't know how they're living. And their only answer is what's the alter like, what's the alternative? Where else can we live? We've already done the live with our parents long enough, they kicked us out. And you can't buy anything because prices have doubled and interest rates are so much higher than they were that the payment on even the worst house I could buy would be closer to 4000. Um, and it was just very interesting just hearing someone's perspective that's 
on the like these are the people that you the housing market needs bartenders it needs people that work in the service industry to buy a house it needs it can't just be investment bankers buying houses and renting them um and i just found it fascinating that this is someone who's not even in the market but is surrounded by people all day that are feeling a high amount of anxiety of rent prices and home prices um and it was interesting enough that this just happened this morning knowing you and i were going to do an episode and i didn't even bring it up i was talking to her about a completely separate thing and she brought it up to me so i don't really think what that lady talked about was um the housing industry or the housing market i just think it's inflation and life so i think there has been an, an enormous uptick in in the cost of everything like i filled up my tank the other day and like i couldn't believe it it was like 110 dollars like i was like holy shit i had 130 man. in my truck 130 but, that was the highest i've ever seen yeah i mean i i drive like 1.2 miles to work so i don't fill it up very often and i was like wow now it goes it's an expense on my business it's still 100 bucks but i remember when 100 bucks was like a big deal now it's a tank of gas the same so, lady it's interesting that you brought that up the same lady say uh told me that she's resorted to she only fills up half her tank because when she fills up a full tank it makes her sad and i just i, I heard that and i thought god damn like that that sucks she's like yeah, i fill up a half a tank i know it's kind of bull but it helps me stay sane because when i fill up a full tank it's just it freaks me out that's wild when you hear some stuff like that i, I don't want to get completely off the rails here but I don't know why whenever there's a Democrat in the White House, gas is $5 a gallon. It feels <laughs> like every time it gas is $5 a gallon, there's a Democrat. Like we're protecting the polar ice caps, but gas is $5 a gallon. But like, I think there's an affordability issue in America. I think it's a big thing. And if you think about where we've been in, in the history, like Occupy Wall Street was when Wall Street made a bunch of money and they tanked the economy and people were out of houses. Like there's an emotional component of this and we're a free market capitalist society. If we don't have the masses being able to afford things, it causes stress and strain. There's statistics about like every time someone loses a house, how many people die? Like the numbers are astounding. Like with every foreclosure, I think with every foreclosure, there's like 0.6 deaths. Like that, that's, that's a real number. Like, like th th that's people have lost their housing, like shelter is a human need. So what I, what I think we need to look at is this. I went to a conference in Miami beach. When I went to this conference for the first time, five years ago, hotel rooms were $300 a night. Hotel rooms were like $900 a night. Holy shit. So you talk about like inflation, it's like nuts. The first time I went to this conference seven years ago, there was like 40 or 50 sponsors this time there was like 300. So like you talk about just things like kind of getting a full head of steam in, and talk about peak, right? So there, there's everywhere you look, there's just signs of warning. And maybe we're wrong. Maybe the home building industry will continue to go bananas and prices will continue to go up. But what I hear is this, one of my favorite adages is warm. We talk about them all the time, Warren Buffett. When people are fearful, when people are greedy, be fearful. Or when people are fearful, be greedy. Everybody's greedy right now. Everybody. So what are, what are my takeaways? Like there was 300 panelists at this event, plus or minus. Less than 5% were contrarians. Less than 5%. Less than 5% didn't so think. So what's the general mood of everyone speaking? So what, who are these people getting up in front? Um, I, I've been to IMN with you. I enjoyed it. I did think a lot of the people were just talking their own books. Yeah. Um, so like, who are these people that are analysts? Who are on these panels that everyone's listening to? All right. So if you would have gone to IMN 10 years ago, the first IMN, who was there was Wall Street. People from Blackstone, like very smart, professional people from mostly sophisticated places, mostly from New York. That was who was there 10 years ago. Today, it's covered with service providers. Like there's a company called Filteries, like if you can't solve, you own single family rentals and you can't solve how to change out your own filters 
hire this company and they'll do it for you. Like I shit you not. Like the easiest thing to do in property management is change a filter. Now there's a company who will do it for you because people have gotten so lazy and so bad at the, um, the operations. So 10 years ago, who was on the panel? Really smart people. Today, it's sponsors. If you sponsor, you get the ability to be on a panel and speak. And, you know, your name is recognized and it says, you know, from so-and-so, and they're not going to ask you to promote your product from stage, but you're going to be speaking and you're going to get publicity because, you know, you're a sponsor. So speaking their own book, most of the people are speaking their own book. One of the biggest takeaways I had, Ian, is A, people are very bullish and B, almost everybody, like the vast majority, I would say somewhere 75% plus of these people are half cycle participants which means they didn't go through the last downturn. They came in at a peak and they've ridden a peak or they came in at the bottom and they've ridden it up. They didn't go back. They didn't ride it back down. So everybody is incredibly optimistic or the vast majority of people are incredibly optimistic because they've never seen it before. And because they've never seen it, they're under this fallacy that they can't, it, it can't happen because they haven't seen it. It's really funny. You just said the half cycle thing. So, um, I lived that when I came to the home building industry, I remember like 2007, um, I was trying to convince our president um, who'd been around forever and he'd seen, I don't know, he, he, he was buying, he was buying real estate when the cavemen were just selling deeds for their, their caves. Uh, he, he'd seen a lot of downturns. Um, and I remember I was arguing about something. It was some new lender I wanted to bring on and the lender was, uh, a little risky, but they were replacing some paper that we didn't quite have as a lender. And, uh, and he just kind of grinned at me and he's like, you know what your problem is? You got a baby face. And I was like, I didn't get it. I just looked at him like, cause I was young as hell at the time. <laughs> I was a lot, I was half his age. You're probably 20. I remember you were like, maybe like 28. 30, maybe 30, 31. Cause this is three years into me being in the company. Right. It's like Oh seven, maybe okay. he's like, you got a baby face. I'm like, what is is that, was Why is this age? relevant? I was pissed. Like, what's my age have to do with this? And he's like, you don't have one scar on your face. Not one. He's like, you've never been through a downturn. You have no idea how ugly this will turn. And he said, and what you don't understand, he's like, because you've seen this market going up for a decade and it just marches up. He's like, it slowly creeps. He's like, every time there's a good housing market, it just keeps creeping like the water level. He was telling me this whole story. He's like, but when it drops, it is violent. It is violent. It is like a it is like a tidal wave, and people don't have time to react. And if you weren't reacting before it drops, you cannot react. Mid, like there is not enough time. He's like Ian. It happened to us. It happened to us. I watched the whole eighties while we steadily marched higher and grew. And when it and when the shoe dropped. It was like in nine months, it wiped out 30% of people that were in the space. And he said, and I have the scars. I have scars all over my body from that experience. You have none. All you've seen is a great market and you just want to keep pouring on the revenue. But I'm telling you right now, I don't know when it's going to happen, but we are going to blink and be like, oh, it's happening. And there's, and if we're not prepared when it happens, we won't be able to get prepared after. And I just, I, when you said half cycle, that's all I can think of because I was a half cycle kid and you were too. 2005, six, seven, you were a half cycle kid. Correct. You, you've been with the company for a decade and you still hadn't seen a downturn. Correct. All you saw was the good. That's it. So my, my, my thinking there is that, similar to what Ian said, there's a lot of people who've only seen the upsides. So if you, if you listen to us regularly, you know what we talk about a lot is business, investing, and we talk about real estate. Ian and I are real estate. At our core, we're real estate guys. Like, I don't know how to read stock charts. I don't know how to do that. So I'm not as good as, as, as most people. It's just not where I spend my time. I spend my time on real estate, but I want to say it from this perspective. There's two ways to acquire real estate, with equity or with debt. Equity is money. Now, you can raise equity, but it basically is just expensive debt or you can have your own money, your own equity, and you can put down. So let's like make this really simple. If you go buy a $100,000 house, that lender is going to require you to come up with somewhere between 5 and 20%. 5000 to $20,000 on a $100,000 purchase, that's your equity. So you have debt against it too, though, because you have $75,000 worth of debt. People like me, 
have millions and millions of dollars worth of debt, like tens of millions. I've got more than, I don't know, 40, 50 million worth of debt, a lot. So the biggest variable or the biggest risk is the debt. People don't lose their houses because of the equity. They lose their house because of the debt, because the debt requires servicing. In English, that means you need to pay for it. So when people get foreclosed on, they lose a job, they can't afford it, and there's risk. So what I look at is this. I've worked really hard. I, I'm not brilliant, but I've tried to become as smart as humanly possible at what I do. And I try and figure out how to read the tea leaves. I talk about reading the Wall Street Journal or paying attention or listening to people. I've been doing that stuff for years, so I don't ever have to be homeless or have to deal with the pain. So what I look at, and again, this is just my opinion, I look at what are my what, what causes risk to me. And the biggest risk to me is debt. I've got a bunch of it. So am I wrong that we're at a peak? I don't know. We're recording this. We'll know soon. I don't necessarily think we're going to see huge drops now in pricing. But what I do think will happen relatively fast is I think it's going to be harder to find liquidity, which we're going to come back to. And I do think now is a great time to sell. If you own something that isn't shelter, it's just an investment, not a bad time to sell. If you own everything in cash, maybe not. But if you do have debt, now's a great time to have a little bit of extra cushion. So if you look at me and say, where are you at the moment? What are you bullish on? I'm bullish on liquidity. There's a lot of liquidity in the market, which we're going to come back to, like I said, and I'm bullish on selling. I'm a net seller more than a net buyer. I just think it's a smart time. I'm looking at the charts, looking at what I see. Maybe I'm wrong, but houses that I bought for 30, 40, 50, $80,000. I showed Ian a picture a couple of days ago of a house that's on the market. It's 800 square feet. It's $240,000. I bought that exact same house for between 20 and 50 grand. And it's a shithole. I mean, a dump. Like, like it's a dump. It's, it's got like a tarp on the roof. And you know, if Frank bought it and sold it, he didn't do shit to make it better. He just threw a can of paint. Can of paint, inside, baby. Old can of paint. Flipped out. that bitch for another 20 grand. He got out. <laughs> but that's a funny joke because I bought 75 houses and there was a write up in the paper. And someone's like, well, hopefully he's going to renovate these things. And they're like, ah, Kaba just throws a can of paint on them. <laughs> so, it whatever. Being I'm... true for about 30 of those 75. Before we <laughs> so, the... whatever Ian thinks, I'm getting a little bit of a big head. He reminds me of what the market thinks. Old can the, of paint. The point of it is this I have a friend of mine who's 70 and his wife is 60. And he asked me a few weeks ago, he goes, So, what do you think? And I went into like my strategy. He goes, that was great. He goes, I'm talking about like, you know, monkey pox and Ukraine. And like, he's thinking about bigger things, but he made me be a little bit reflective. And his wife and I were talking about stuff and we do a lot of business together. And she was like, well, 20 years ago, I had more debt, I have less debt. And I thought about that for a few days. I'm like, she's right. She's got a less stressful life than me because she doesn't have any debt. Ian and I both lived through the pandemic. He had a different experience than me. He played baseball with IJ. He didn't have debt. I had a lot of debt. So the way that I look at it now is this. I think with the number of assets that I have, now is a good time to sell some at a very high number where I'm going to make a great profit. And I'm going to walk away from it with having a lot less debt when that's over with and get to a point where I have a little bit less stress. Is that the right thing for you? I don't know. You have to pick. But the reason I'm doing it is this way. I want less debt or less risk. I want more cash. And I think liquidity is strong. If liquidity is strong, banks will lend to you. I think now's a great time to get a home equity line of credit against your house. The value is really high and you probably have equity and you don't know if you're ever going to need it, but the time to have it is now. When you have as many assets as I have, now's a great time to have big lines of credit. Um, three years ago, I changed accounting firms and moved over to one who they're not like the big four, but they're like in that next tier. But people like Wells Fargo listen to their accounting and say, okay, this guy's a good risk because he's got good books by this accounting firm. I'm getting lines with them. Why? Sometime in the future, I think there's going to be an opportunity to buy. So I think the market is high and hot. I think now's a great time to sell. I think now's a good time to have less debt. I think now's a good time to have cash and be able to have multiples or options with your cash. And what I heard at that panel is go, baby. There is no way in hell this market comes down, which I think is the reason and the moment when it starts to. The problem that happens in real estate, and, and Frank did a great job of explaining equity and debt. Um, let's just take the property that Frank bought for 25 grand a decade ago and is now listing for 250. 
Um, maybe it goes for 250, maybe it goes for 230, who cares? It's roughly 10X what Frank could have bought it back then. So buying that house is going to, look, it's only older and crappier now than it was when Frank owned it. And, you know, it's only gonna be more expensive to operate that thing. And to fix it, because the cost of materials has gone up. Yes, What are, are the odds better of it going up another 10x or the odds better of it dropping 50 percent because even if it drops 50 percent that's a 5x increase over what you bought it for a decade ago which is still incredible historically speaking in real estate to go up 5x over a decade so if that thing drops 50 grand 100 grand and someone put 80 percent debt on it and they can't get rents on it. That's when foreclosures start. That's when, and, and to me, when you go look at a market that's done what it's done, you go look at the Case Shiller index, it's up 60, 70% in the last decade. You can find very few periods in the history of the Case Shiller index where you're up 60, 70% over a decade. One of them being the Great Depression that we went through a decade ago, the Great Recession. Um, does that mean this is 2008 and we're collapsing? I don't think so. But 2005, we knew this is completely unsustainable and it's going to end terribly. We knew it. We just didn't know how it was going to end terribly. But we knew in 05, it was an irrational market that was doomed to fail. And it's feeling a lot like 2005 to me right now because I see so many people are just completely priced out of the market. There's no sanity with these debt to income ratios. So in 2005, I was 30 um, and I had just become a sales manager and I was working in um, a suburb of Washington, D.C. I was about 45 miles west of Washington, D.C. And I got promoted to the job and there was a woman who was getting ready to go on maternity leave. So for, a for three months, she trained me and her last day was like right around Memorial Day. And she went on maternity leave and she came back on Labor Day. And when she left, so basically call it May 31st, and then she came back like, you know, September. So what changed was this. When she left, we were constantly raising prices, like prices were going up 20, 30, 40 grand on weekends. Like we'd sell eight houses in a month and we'd raise the price a bunch in the, in the neighborhood. And this is how builders control inventory. What happened when she came back sat in my office and I was fighting to keep three contracts from canceling. Because if you have a sold contract to somebody who paid a price from six to 12 months ago, they're going to pay more than what the market's going to pay for it now. So what you're better off doing is what's called retrading or renegotiating the contract. And she looked at me and she's like, what are you doing? Like, we should be raising prices. I'm like, no, no, no. You have a three month old and the whole world has changed. If you have a three, if you've ever had a baby, you know, your world has changed already. Her world changed twice. She had a kid and the, what she was standing on was no longer solid ground. It was quicksand. And we had to renegotiate the price. And this was June, July, August, 2005. When you talk to most sane people who are paying attention, they will tell you that the housing market started to dip in like, oh, wait, they're wrong. The housing market started to dip in 2005. The greater population started to feel it in 2008. And between 2008 and 2012, it continued to come down to a point where in about 2012, Wall Street said, these houses are now underpriced compared to replacement value. There is a trade here. They're buying a discounted asset at a low number, and they're going to get in at a low basis where it, it could go down, but it can't go down a ton more because it just doesn't make any sense that it could, and eventually it'll come back up. And that's what happened in that stretch of time. So what I'm telling you right now is it is not 2008 in housing. Everybody is still very optimistic. In 2008, the housing market wasn't optimistic. In 2005, it still was. But there were smart people in 2005 who noticed the, the story's changing. The fundamentals are different. We're no longer raising prices. I think we're there. You could still get a ninja loan in 2005. You can still get a home equity line of credit today. In 2008, you couldn't. In 2026, I don't know if you could. So the point is the tide hasn't gone out yet. It's going to. Now, the stock market, the tide is out a little bit. 
the tide is out a little bit on Bitcoin. Like I knew Bitcoin, I don't know, I knew nothing about Bitcoin. I knew Bitcoin was going to crash when I was at a playground and heard some people talking about Bitcoin, like plumbers used to talk about internet stocks in 1999 and 2000. Like you knew it was going to crash when that was going to happen. So the point of the matter is, is if you are in real estate and you're invested in it, it's still early. There's still time. Me and I have talked about this over the last couple of months, a bunch, because this is kind of where we're at. It's, it's still time to consider lightening your load. I don't think it's time to, right. I, I feel like we're within the last couple of years of this cycle. So if you're buying, you're hoping that there's a greater fool coming behind you that's going to buy at even a little higher price after that. Unless you can get deals and you are particularly good at adding value, the speculation of buying and expecting it to be higher, I think is a little bit of fool's gold. And, um, and just, just to give numbers to this, so in, in the first quarter of 2007, uh, the median sales price um, of all homes sold in the United States was $257,000. That was Q107. That was that was the last big peak, um, and then went through a period of five six years where it took five six years to get back to that peak. But since then, it's been absolutely off to the races. So we hit another peak in fourth quarter of seventeen, three hundred thirty seven thousand, and right now it stands at four hundred twenty four thousand dollars. That's a 69% increase over the previous peak when people were completely priced out of the market to the point where people had to take out complete bullcrap loans that didn't make any sense with teaser rates, subprime, get anyone into the market they could. That's the last one. So we are now officially 69% higher on the median than at the peak of insanity of mortgage lending that drove those prices way higher than they should have been. Um, so for me, yeah, maybe there's still time, but there's time to sell. I, I, I wouldn't be looking at residential real estate as unless you have an operation like Frank that is good at spotting a great deal and adding value. If you're just buying, and Frank calls this wholesale, if you're buying and looking to sell it right away, you're hoping that some fool is going to pay more than you did. That's all you're hoping. All the bigger fool's theory. Yep. And, and at an absolute peak of pricing, like an absolute, I don't know if it won't go up any higher than here, but what I can tell you is we are at a peak all time and by a lot. It's like we've blown through any kind of a rational trend line. If you go, just go to the, St. Louis median sales price, just Google that in St. Louis, St. Fed, Louis Fed and look at this chart and it looks just like the tech boom of 1999. It looks that insane. And we only add 3% a year to our population. Where are all these buyers coming from? This is just asset inflation because we haven't started enough houses over the last 15 years. There's just more people fighting for less supply, it, it ends badly because people can't afford it. They're not going to keep doing it. And there's going to become pressure at some point in the not too distant future on rates, right? If we continue to have inflation, which we probably will, the government is going to have to continue to raise interest rates, which is going to cause a major affordability problem. So the government's going to pretty much have to stimulate, I think, the mortgage industry in some way, and they're going to have to create product and it'll mostly come out through FHA, which is government owned. Um, and what they'll do is they'll come up with products that are going to be like, th there's this, there's a 30 year fixed mortgage. There's an arm, which is an adjustable rate mortgage, right? So like if you have five, one arm, it means that it's fixed for five years. And then the one, so five slash one, the one means that can just every year after that. And then there's caps. So if you have a 5% interest rate, you're going to be capped at no more than 2% up in a year and six for the life of the loan. That's usually how an arm works. A 30-year fix means it's fixed for the whole life. But if the 30-year fixed rate is too high, people use either an arm because the rate's a little bit lower, or they have to use what's called a buy-down. When I got into um, home sales, 
there was like a two one buy down. Our boy Kenny, who we talk about all the time, talks about how in like the set, like the seventies and eighties, there was a five, four, three, two, one buy down. It would go back five years to get the rate lower. So there's going to have to be some kind of product because the people in the market can't figure out how to pay because it's too expensive because of rates. So they're going to have to be some kind of an incentive. But all of these things, if we have to do that, prices will adjust. And th these are the warning signs that start to come up because we have scars. I've got wrinkles on my face because I've gone through this and I worry about it all the time. So what happens is people get pissed just like they're pissed off right now about oil prices, right? gas prices, and they threaten to vote for different politicians. Yep. And new politicians come up, they arise, who say, I'm going to run on low gas prices because I can see that people are pretty pissed off. And the president starts changing his tone and maybe he's going to go meet with ExxonMobil right, to try to get some good favorability with the people saying I'm now partnering with, uh, you know, partnering with major providers to see what we can do. And new politicians will come in and say, we've talked to all of you in your town halls. Housing affordability is important. We are going to run and we are going to revamp Fannie and Freddie. And here we go again, FHA. And we're going to come out with a 40-year mortgage product. And maybe we're going to bring some interest only payments to get your payment down. This all sounds familiar because the truth is that this time is different. It's never different. Prices get too high. It's not affordable. Politicians get involved, try to manipulate the market and do things that they know haven't worked in the past, but they are making decisions based on the short term angst of the populace. And that's going to happen. So is it, do I see home prices collapsing in the next six months, 12 months, 18 months, even two years? I don't. I think I'm shaking be, my head vigorously now. I think there'll be another surge because what I think is going to happen is the same reason why we couldn't just leave it alone. It's all politics of everything we've done the last the trillion dollars we spent of stimulus for COVID. That's politics. That's that's trying to buy votes. There will be more votes bought through housing subsidies because people can't afford it until they blow up. And when they blow up, it's when home prices collapse, it's almost always a banking issue. It's almost never a supply, a true supply and demand issue. It's almost always a some kind of a lending crisis that happens where there's a crisis of confidence, people foreclose and banks go collect their money. And then when they sell an REO property, real estate owned property of a bank, they're going to sell it at whatever the hell they need to sell it at to cover the loan. So they don't mind dropping the price 30%. And then that, that destabilizes the whole market. That's what's next. That's like, what's next is probably more stimulus, probably more stupidity by the government to keep this thing going into just a few more innings. Hey, Ian, what's the front end ratio? So a uh, debt to income ratio is principal interest and taxes. Um, so your, your mortgage payment versus your taxable income. Correct. So a front end ratio is something that every lender should know. Most people in this industry should know. Most people I've surveyed do not know. If uh, I which, make uh, so so a quick example, if I make uh, ten thousand dollars a month before uh, taxes, your before gross taxes, income, you make a hundred. Hold on a second, you make one hundred twenty grand a year, ten thousand dollars a month. Go ahead, ten thousand dollars a month, and your mortgage payment is four thousand. My front end ratio or front debt to income ratio would be forty percent. Correct. Now, what that doesn't factor in is food, gas household expenses, credit cards, daycare, alimony, anything else you must pay. So right now, the industry average or the, the, the median front-end ratio in the U.S. is 38%, which means that people at, are paying 38% of their gross, not their net, their gross towards their housing, which means we are at the peak of affordability. We are just about to clip, clip over affordability. Now, Ian understands underwriting ratios better than me. When I would sell a house, uh, 
That's an insanely I, high number. Very high. Average. Like an something around like 32 number. was kind of well, like that, your- that number must be. So that's that's a number that one of the panelists says that must be on new issuance. That must be on new because you have people that have been living in houses 20 years. that have For sure. This house. isn't the average. It no, must no, no, be no, like 2022 new, new mortgage applications. Yes. Um, 38%. That is a really high number. Normally you want to like a safe number is 28 to 31%. And that's kind of like, you get higher than that and an underwriter is really taking a cross-eyed look at it. Right. 32% is the number where I thought it was starting to get high. 35%, you're like, you got to kind of white knuckle it. 38% was high. Well, because, because there's, there's the, so Frank's talking about front ratio. They call it a front and a back ratio. The back ratio is total debt. So that's also taking into account any credit card monthly payments you have. If you have a car payment, if you have any other regular payments that go out farther than a year, those are added in. So someone with a 38% front ratio likely has a car payment, likely has some credit cards, likely has student debt almost always, right, uh, that you run into. So they're probably pushing 50, 55% of their not take home, pre-tax income is going to debt they already have to pay. Then they get taxed. Now they've got themselves a couple hundred bucks to buy groceries and gas, and that's it. So here's what's crazy, right? The median income right now is of Q1, 20, excuse me, the median sales price of a home today is $428,000. But interest rates have gone up. What would have bought you $400,000 worth of house when interest rates were sub three, a year ago, you could have bought a $400,000 house, but that same house now, or that same payment today is now going to buy you a $240,000 house. That's a staggering number. So a 240 house is now selling for 400. People don't say I'm in the market for a $400,000 house and then go and decide, you know what? I'll buy a 260 house. It's a significantly different house. Like, like th those aren't the same. That's not the same ballpark. So what I think will happen is people will continue to stretch to get in or people will wait. And I think one of two things starts to kind of happen. If people stretch, well, their car breaks down and they got to go to work. So they fix their car, but they fall behind on paying for their mortgage. And there's no longer forbearance. And these people, because they're on a razor thin line, they go to foreclosure. There haven't been any foreclosures in the market in several years because of all the forbearance. So we're sitting on something in the neighborhood of 9 million pieces of inventory. Um, I can find the exact stat when Ian starts talking again, but there's 9 million pieces of inventory that are hanging out there that are ready to be foreclosed on, which is going to add to inventory. So these things are going to, what, what I'm getting at is, we're at a razor edge up top. People are going to have a hard time paying. They're going to fall behind. And there's already people who are behind that haven't been able to work through the system. So when we start talking about the fact that there's no inventory, if this stuff starts hitting the market quickly, it's going to really change the inventory scenario very fast. Frankie, there's no foreclosures because the home prices are going up 15, 20% a year. If you fall behind on a payment, let's say you lose your job, even without the government stimulus and the help, if you fall behind on payments and you just can't make the payments anymore, you list the property for 25% more than you paid for it. And that covers the debt and you're done. You don't have to foreclose. But when prices stop, this is the musical chairs uh, atmosphere that we're running into right now. When prices just stay flat, right? So we just did an episode on why we think a recession starting. We think there are gonna be a lot of people who lose their jobs. We think unemployment rate's going to creep up. We have a lot of reasons that we give for that. But if that happens and home prices just stay flat, they just don't go up. Well, those people can't sell their house and cover the mortgage. They're going to foreclose. And that brings a whole nother wave of pain into the economy when that happens. There's never foreclosures in a market that's screaming higher. And the reason is you can sell the house. You don't need, you can cover your debt. You can pay the bank back by selling. You get bailed out by the market um, and speculation. We've been at an all time high in pricing since somewhere in around 2017. So if we come underneath that, then this, this ends. Like you're correct that most people do have equity, but I'm in business because people don't know how to realize the equity. 
they call me or someone like me because even though they have X number of dollars in equity, they don't know how to put on the market. They're scared of the process, whatever. So, I mean, we are actually seeing more than almost a hundred people per week that are in some level of foreclosure who are calling us or reaching out to us because they want us to come. And, and I serve as a very small market. So like, like these things are, are, are becoming pretty real and it's going it, to, but again, and, and at it, your price points, the, the vast majority of the price points you play at, those are FHA VA buyers where they have a very high um, a very high percentage of the equity. So you can get a 97% or with a gift, almost a hundred percent, uh, uh, loan on some of those. So in those spots of the market, if markets stay flat at all, they're done. Whereas in conventional loans, you're, you're, t you tend to put down 15, 20%. Um, so you have a little more cushion. Frank is playing in a world in that 150 to 350 range, high percentage of those customers are government loans with very high um, LTVs, loan to values. Right, a government loan basically means it's non-conventional. Non-conventional is like someone who isn't the government is gonna back that, so it has to perform. But the government kind of rounds in the favor of the everyman and the person who needs help getting into a house. So they lower their borrowing standards because the U.S. government wants people to be on their own and own a home versus live in something subsidized. So they, it, it's still a little bit of a subsidy, but it's it's slightly different. It creates home ownership, but that's the grouping of people who um, who are hit first. The, if you only have three percent to put out down on a house, like when I bought my house, it was an expensive house. Put down thirty five percent on a ex, you know an expensive house. If you're buying a starter home and you only can put 3% down, like you don't, have room, you don't have money for blinds or furniture, like, like, like things start to happen pretty quick. So I'm gonna pivot to something a little bit different, but I, it, it's comparable. So how did we get here? Let's talk about it. Everybody talks about the black swan event. The black swan event is COVID. So COVID comes in, the market shuts down, everything stops, like we're all living from home, we're using Zoom a lot more, everyone's watching, I don't remember the show with the guy with the mullet and the tiger, um, and you know, that poor guy showed up, you know, the porn star in like every picture, like everybody was bored, like, so we have this period of three or four months, right, everybody gets stir crazy, government prints a bunch of money, so there's a black swan event with COVID, but there's another black swan event, housing. So in 2020, nobody wanted to sell because nobody wanted a stranger in their house. Like unless you had to have somebody in their house, every person you looked at who wasn't your family, you thought could potentially kill you. So if you didn't have to sell, you didn't sell. So there's no inventory. 2021 vaccine comes out, people are starting to open up, the world's starting to change a little bit. So I think the fundamentals of the market have changed since 2020. The best and smartest thing I heard at this event was this. 2021 was actually the black swan event for housing. Here's why. No inventory in 2020 causes supply and demand. It's simple. If there's no demand, price goes higher. If there's no supply, price goes higher. So in 2021, prices went up. And then human emotion took over. People who were probably not in the housing market till 2022 or 2023 are like, oh my God, all these houses are going for sale at these astronomical numbers. If I don't get in now, I can't get in. Animal so spirits, people, animal spirits, right? FOMO, fear of missing out. So 2021, if you look at the chart that Ian and I are talking about, and we're going to put it in the chat, like Q1 of 2021, the median housing price was 370. Q1 of 2022, it's 428. 50,000, one out of like 15% in one year. And it's because of all of the factors. So it doesn't, it's not sustainable because of the fact that we had this weird thing that happened. The black swan event in housing is no inventory, nobody's shopping, nobody's doing it. Oh my God, you factor that into, I can't, I'll never be able to buy a house, so I'll get in now. My wife is a professor. Her friends are brilliant, but none of them know real estate. And during 2021, the beginning of 22, I can't tell you the number of her friends are like, I think it's time for me to buy a house. They're feeling, they're feeling that they're going to miss out. So like there's this weird mad rush of people getting into the market. And what happens with that, when everybody's running in, the smart people are selling and getting out. Are you seeing a different, um, you compete with everybody on deals. You're trying to buy deals. You're selling deals. Are you seeing a different 
um, avatar of person who is offering money to you for your properties when you sell? And are you competing with different people when you buy? Like there was a period of time where New York was all over the place and they would come swoop in and buy up big batches. Yeah. Do you still see some of that or is it a little different? So the easiest way to answer your question is because it's, it's actually a complicated question, right? So I've got friends in San Diego. I was talking to a realtor friend of mine in Richmond this morning. When the market went bananas, you would start to have like bidding wars, sight unseen. People were buying all this crate, like all the fundamentals of home buying went out the window and you started to see this crazy stuff. Like you get 10, 15, 20, 30 offers. You'd have an open house and like, it was like standing room. Like you'd have an open house Friday and Saturday, 15 minutes from 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. And you couldn't, like, you, you wouldn't even be able to get an appointment. Like it was that nuts. That's over. In the old days, when you used to get 10 to 20 offers, you now might get one. Instead of you getting even an offer in the first weekend, you might get an offer on the eighth day it was listed. So people have, they're tired of losing, they're tired of the euphoria, uh, they're tired of all that. So they're, they pulled back a little bit. Affordability has changed drastically. And the person buying, if there was a, like I just talked about with the FOMO and the, myth, the fear of missing out, if you really needed to buy a new home for need, not for want, you did it. You've already done it. So now you've got someone who's a little bit more discretionary or somebody who is, not in a, in a must situation. If someone's not in a must situation, what happens is they don't buy and they're not flocking. So does that answer? That's part of the equation. I'll get to the professional buyer in a second. Yep. So on the sell side, as you're selling multiple, are you seeing different, different folks that are interested in buying from you? And are you seeing the prices changing? This is the crux of what we're talking about. I still think there are people who are optimistic and you get into this flywheel situation. Single family residential real estate has become a self-fulfilling prophecy. There are people who make their living, 100% of their living, flipping houses, buying it, selling it. So they haven't really adjusted their buying parameters. The professional buyers, I think, have. And when I say professional, I don't mean you've quit your job and you do four a year. I mean, Wall Street. I think Wall Street has looked at their perspectives a little, a little bit. But I do think um, by and large, there's still a lot of euphoria in the market from a sell perspective and people haven't come to reality with the fact that on the back end, when it's time to sell, it's not going to, the market's going to be weaker. Here's a statistic that I think is interesting. From the same conference, I learned that several lenders have said they've gone through the, the most extensions by percentage that they've ever had to give to flippers. So you get a nine month note or a 12 month note. And what you need to do is you need to extend and you're extending for a few reasons. You can't finish the product if you're selling it, right? Supply chain problems, permitting problems, labor shortages, all of those things. In addition to that, you're also dealing with interest rates have ticked up. So if you have a fix and flip that you've turned into a rental, you've gotten it ready. You can't refinance it now because the interest rates have gone up. So it no longer cash flows. So you say, oh, okay, screw it. I'm going to just take, pay my private money lender an extra quarter. But that costs money. And if the market doesn't continue to appreciate over time, what happens is those things eventually get foreclosed on. Last week, I had meetings with two private lenders in my market and said, are you starting to foreclose? They're like, yeah. I'm like, I'm a buyer, just an FYI. Um, you and I've talked about that privately and like I, the, both of them were like, oh, I didn't realize you would do that. I'm like, oh yeah, I'll self-perform the work for you. You can carry the note. They're like, interesting. I haven't had to foreclose on anything in about three years, but I'm foreclosing now on 30 properties out of 400 that I own. It, it, that's why. It's funny um, in the last downturn. So we were still servicing a bunch of mortgages that we weren't able to sell for a while. Explain that, that to people because most people don't know what that means. We sent you payments. So it was, it was our job. Uh, it was our job to make sure that you paid every month. We'd send so, you a So you work for a big lender and the big lender worked for a home builder, right? And normally what they do is they get the loan securitized and then they sell the paper or they sell the note in a package. Tranche you heard last time in the downturn. If you ever saw the big short talk about mortgage tranches. So they would sell that tranche of paper. NVR would sell it to somebody else. And then somebody else would send you a payment booklet and you'd make that payment. What Ian is saying is they couldn't sell it or they couldn't make their margin. So they would hold the paper or service it themselves, which means they still have the debt. They haven't been able to sell it. Yep. And uh, 
we started having foreclosures. People couldn't pay and we're talking to them, but we didn't have the skill set left in our organization to deal with a foreclosure. It's right. So when you get into it, it's like, oh, foreclose. It's like, all right, well, you got to you got to give them notice to move out. If they don't move out and give you the finger, you got to get a sheriff. The sheriff, depending on the state you're in, there's different laws. They might give them three months, six months in some places. Like, and in the meantime, they're destroying your house because they're mad at you. So they start tearing the walls up and breaking toilets with sledgehammers and all kinds of disgusting things because they're mad at you as a lender. And they're in really no laws to go pursue them because they're foreclosing Bro. means they're already bankrupt so it's like, money <laughs> it's like the old charlie rogers uh with the lions we drafted him first and uh he ended up becoming a a, a loser and we so the lions sued him for like a 30 million dollar signing bonus and he said come get it i smoked it all <laughs> he was bankrupt he had nothing um but then we started to tell, like, to tell you how bad this gets i'll give you a real story i own a house I, so of all the houses i own about one time a year Someone goes through the entire house with a hammer. And when I go into the house, we check these things quarterly. Within a quarter, they've taken a hammer and there's no longer drywall. Like, I, I'm not kidding you. They take a hammer to every piece of drywall in the house and it's down to the studs. Yeah, they're like the, selling the copper. They're selling like whatever they can get their hands on. It's incredible. They're fleecing you. Yeah, they fleece you. So, but we you know, we started reaching out to some people and saying, what are you doing for foreclosures? And even the big banks and the big servicers, they just didn't have the skill set anymore. They didn't know what to do. It had been a decade since there were lots of foreclosures. It takes, they had to build entire departments to deal with foreclosures and uh, uh, delinquent payments, all that. So that's all coming again, you know, as, as we move into a recession and we're at peak prices and people are up to their throat in debt with record debt to income ratios. That's all coming, but it takes, I think the point we're both making here, Frank is it could take two, three years, but it started already. I think it has started. I think, I think real estate is historically hard to see it coming because it's such an illiquid investment. It's there's debt. You have to get, go through underwriting. There are multiple payments versus, you know, when people panic in crypto, they get in their Coinbase app and they hit sell and they're out and they they take their 50% loss. You can't just sell a house on an app. You have to list it. People have to come look at it. You have to make it look nice. It's just a, it's just a clumsy thing to sell or to even buy. Whereas in we've seen the pain in the stock market We've seen it in crypto already because they're incredibly easy to buy and sell when the market readjusts its prices. And there's not, not a lot of debt in either of those two. Right. There, it's a very liquid market where a house is illiquid. It, it takes a lot more time to get there. So there's a big difference between doing a podcast at home and doing a podcast at my office. At my office, nobody bothers me. Um, I can send a text and someone will bring me a cup of coffee or water. While I'm home, my wife will send me texts that says the real gas prices by presidential term, refuting what I said earlier. But I, she literally sent me a quick quote. Well, she overheard you. She had uh, <laughs> she had something to say about you making fun of Democrats and Correct. gas prices. Yes. yes, you stand. You stand. She she refutes. I'm it, no doubt it came from CNN or some other bull. Uh, Ellie's uh, watching Yahoo. Yeah, Yahoo, there you go. That's you know it's legit when it comes from Yahoo. So take us home, big guy. What um what should people do if uh if they own some uh investment properties? What should they do about real estate right now? What what are some takeaways? So the biggest takeaway for me with this conference is everything was speculative, everything was um vendors. The last panel when nobody was left. The first morning, there was standing room only. They literally said, we can't let you in because there's, we're at over capacity. The last panel, there was probably capacity for a thousand people and there might've been 80 of us in the room. And it was for two economists. One of them's name is Dominic Provience. He's with the Federal Reserve Bank of Atlanta. Um, and he said the following, and I love this. 
He goes, I had a, he, this is him speaking. I had a professor. He's, if you look him up, he's got a pretty strong resume of where he went to college and he got a, an MBA. Um, I had a professor who said the following, demand equals people plus bucks. That's demand, people plus bucks. And he kept coming back to demand is people plus bucks. And short of a genocide, we're gonna have people. But bucks is the big thing. What I see in the market today is there's still a good amount of liquidity. What that means in English is the government printed a bunch of money. People have more savings than they've ever had. They have equity in their homes. People are frothy. People are looking at deals with Ian and me to invest in, keep the car alarm company. Um, they want to invest in our real estate deals. But Ian's already talking about like in an episode we did prior, like venture capitalist firms are having a harder time raising money because the bucks are starting to move away. In the housing market, bucks are becoming less valuable. There's inflation, interest rates are higher. So what's happening is the people are gonna remain, but the bucks are gonna go away. And as the bucks start to go away, this market gets hit. When Alistair was on, we talked about the, the whip handle, right? The whip handle is the first world countries. The end of the whip, which you hit the animal with, is what ends up happening. Real estate is not on the whip handle. The stock market is, equities are, that's the whip handle. The actual whip is the housing market. What we're telling you is we believe that the whip is coming. So if you want to get yourself to the handle, which is a much more comfortable spot to be, be a little bit more in cash, have a little bit less risk, have a little bit less debt, have those things set up. Like I make a joke constantly. When the tide comes in, which it will, do you want to, do you, do you want to hit your ankles? Do you want to hit your knees? Or do you want to need a snorkel? I do not want to need a snorkel. I prefer it didn't even come up to my knees. Maybe it touches my ankles. My risk profile is different than it was years ago. We're at a different point in the market. So to me, the thing to do is be cautious. If you see a great deal, underwrite it with really good standards. Underwrite it with standards of, I might not get any appreciation and I might have depreciation for a while. Warren Buffett talks about not timing the bottom of a market. He doesn't need the time about of a market. He didn't buy it at its absolute peak. It could come back a little bit, but he knows he wants to own it for years. That's the beauty of real estate. You need to own it for years. If you're cool with that, it's a great time to buy. But if you're not cool with that and you're worrying on speculation, it's not a great time to speculate. Be honest. It's a 12 to 14 year bull run in real estate. Look at some charts. That's a long time. So what I think now is a great time to do to be a little bit a little bit heavier in cash, not speculate as much, and think that hey, a storm is coming, and how do I want to prepare for it? And I think the only thing I'll I'll add to that before we wrap this thing up completely is, if you're going to invest in anything, invest in things that have good cash flow, um, and invest for the specific reason of cash flow. I think the time to invest and hope there's a greater fool after you to pay more money and that's all the value you add as you think you bought something at a special price. I think that that is a uh, foolish way to go about investing right now. Go for things. If you buy something, you say, that's look, that's in a good market. It's going to cash flow. I'm going to get paid on a monthly basis. I think it's the same with stocks. You buy stocks that are generating good cash flow that have large hordes of cash that when times get rough, they'll be able to invest. And it's the same with real estate. Don't buy it hoping that the price will go up. The odds of it going up and you timing it perfect before it goes back down. Right now, historically speaking, we've not had many runs like this in the last 130 years in America. We just, we have not had many runs like this price-wise, if at all, and they've all ended badly. Now, does that mean it's ending badly now? No, but they all end badly. And especially for the people that bought properties at the end and put a lot of debt on it. That's how it ends badly for you. So if you are going to go buy something and you're thinking about putting 90, 95% debt on it at these prices, and you don't have a big store of cash that could get you through a two, three year downturn, you deserve what's coming to you because it's not, it's going to end badly for you. So one, if you said, summarize this in 30 seconds or less, what I would tell you is this, be honest about your cash position and be honest about your expenses versus your ability to get the cash. 
Um, when I quit my job in 2009, a bunch of people called me. Ian's the only one who called me and said, are you okay financially? And I said, yeah, man, I can probably live for 10 years without a job. He goes, <laughs> that's pretty good. Um, I can still do that. Now it's not all in cash. I've got some equity. I've got some things that I can do, but like that's maybe a little bit too much cash, right? But the point of the matter is, do you have access to it? If your legs get cut out from underneath you, can you survive? And it's up to you to think about those things and imagine a worst case scenario. And if you imagine a worst case scenario and you can make it through it, perfect. I use the analogy all the time, going into the recession, into a recession, you know who's on your lifeboat. Financially, how do you get on the lifeboat and live? Who are the people around you from a personal perspective and from a work perspective? Who gets on the lifeboat and who makes it? And if you're honest about that, we still have time. We're not yet officially in a recession. We're certainly not in a housing recession. Contrary to what all those morons are telling you, I do believe it's coming. And I believe it's up to you to be proactive and take that and move forward with it. Get your house in order. Just we always talk about no one thinks about the downside. No one thinks about what could happen. We've now tipped to the point where the risk is much higher than the reward. Yep. So if something bad were to happen, how would you weather the storm? There's a storm coming. I don't know if it's a category five hurricane. I don't, I, I probably don't think it is, or if it's just going to be a, a Northeaster, right? Whatever they call them, you know, I don't know, but it makes sense to go put some storm guards on your windows. It makes sense to just kind of stock up on some extra water. Just have your house in order that you can make it through a couple of years of a really ugly environment. If, if possible, now is not the time to go get levered up to your eyeballs. Now is the time to try to get a little more cash, a little bit more of a, you know, maybe you don't have 10 years of spend like Frank, but stretch it. You shouldn't have two months of spend because when it happens, I'll go back to my president that told me I didn't have enough scars. He was absolutely right. As soon as, as soon as public confidence panic, just like animal spirits will take a market up, they will take it down so fast. People will pull their money out faster than you can imagine. And when it happens, you don't have time to go do the things we're talking about doing right now. So, so we'll, we'll, we'll end in this. When you think of biblical re um, references, I know I come to mind near the top. Ian, when did Noah build the ark? If I know. Before the rain. Before oh, that's the a rain. good point. That's a good point. Noah, this is a, this is this, he's in the Holy Bible. Is this the, is this the St. James version? The Have you ever Saint heard Mark of Noah's Ark, Ian? Have version? you ever heard of Noah's Ark? I think I have. Wasn't that Russell Crowe? Didn't he play him in a movie on the same topic? Steve Carell. Okay. But um, the, the point of the matter is, if you use the reference and it goes back thousands of years, Noah built the Ark before the rain. What we're saying is it's going to rain, whatever your Ark looks like, build it now. And if you're not filled with the Holy Spirit like Frank Cava, you should have more cash. See you, buddy. See you, man.